Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Esther, for, uh, for organizing. And um, so I'll, what I'll do with my 25 minutes is I'll give you an overview of the various um, uh, streams of work, work streams that we're involved in, um, with, in collaboration pr primarily with the Bangladesh government, but also doing some work in Sierra Leone and Nepal and, and a couple of other countries. Uh, but our work in Bangladesh is what I'm, what I'm mainly focused on. And, and then there's multiple work streams and I'll just like highlight one or two and talk to you given the, you know, the profile of this audience, I'll talk to you about a one particular project that should be of interest to the, an interdisciplinary audience with this particular you know, disciplinary configuration. Okay. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, where I should share this one. Okay. Um, so, uh, so you know, I'm uh, representing this um, organization that Yale we founded called YRISE, the Yale Research Initiative on Innovation and Scale. And the work I'll talk about is with many, many co-authors. So, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm having to skip over many, many names here. So, I have this first slide to just give you an overview of the various work streams. Um, so, just to give a little bit of history, since March, you know, uh, COVID hit the U.S. and you know, YRISE has been working on uh, totally unrelated things, which is about how do we scale up um, interventions that appear to be promising uh, in terms of their effectiveness and improving people's lives. And there are all these complexities that arise during scaling, and that's what we normally uh, work on and study. But we, you know, uh, stopped all of our any kind of in-person data collection and intervention and work um, uh, in in all countries where we work, and we kind of repurposed those. Um, that research infrastructure in order to be responsive to governments wherever they needed help uh, for COVID response policy. And something that struck me, I'm from Bangladesh uh, and, and all of our work is now, you know, actually fully integrated with the governments and we're I'm quite closely connected to the government. And, um, you know, I, I realized that, um, you know, one of the things, one of the challenges that we'll face pretty soon is that all of the other stories we were hearing about how to handle the crisis involved things like testing and building, you know, large scale testing infrastructure. And especially in rural Bangladesh, we never, we will not have that uh, happening anytime soon. Um, and so are there other indirect ways for us to collect data and be helpful in order to get some sense of whether the disease has arrived, whether it's spreading, exactly where and how do we uh, devise policies in response. Right? So that's why we started doing this high frequency data collection where the general idea was, you know, for our existing work, which, has, which is unrelated to COVID, we were already collecting data on large numbers of people, about 20, 30,000 people around the country for other projects. So we sort of had some statistically representative samples or understood how, what adjustments we need to make in order to make them representative. Um, and so we just continue to follow up on those samples. Um, and the value of that is not only the representativeness, um, but also the fact that when you have baseline data, that allows you to make much better statistical inferences looking at pre post changes rather than just cross sectional data after the, after the crisis hits. And so we started collect, doing some syndromic surveillance, right, but also collecting information on public health behavior, knowledge, things like mask use, social distancing behavior. Right? But it was also clear that this crisis was going to soon become an economic crisis as much as a public health one. So we started collecting information on employment shocks and income shocks and prevalence of food insecurity, um, especially in areas where even in a normal year, uh, we, we have some insecurity. Um, what's happening to food prices? Are there shortages appearing in certain parts of the country, et cetera, et cetera. And then we also collected information on people's movement because, you know, given that it's a disease with human to human transmission, it, it was important for us to track uh, migration. And while we were making all these phone calls, it became clear that, you know, some value we could add is not just collect data via phone calls, but use some of these phone calls to also spread messages. Right? So I had been running randomized control trials in other sectors and settings, like in Malawi, trying to disseminate information about new agricultural practices in person using you know keynotes in various social networks in the village and those proved to be successful to improve or hasten the adoption of productive agricultural technologies and so then the idea was oh can we employ some of these strategies here except for public health messaging and you know on the phone 
And do we need to use similar strategies like providing incentives for people who are passing on these messages and telling them, you know, we'll give you some phone credits if you pass that to on, etc. So we're also like running these quick and easy interventions uh, to complement the government's kind of wide broadcast type messaging. And uh, another, I'll move down here, another um, area that became important for developing countries in particular, and I'll get into a little bit of depth here in a, in a few slides, is that you know a lot of what we were hearing back in March and April was epidemiological models. So models which were largely about the behavior of the virus and how it spreads. Right? Now, especially when you get into developing countries, low and middle income countries, where adherence to social distancing may not be uniform and it's going to be very difficult to monitor and enforce people's behaviors, then it's important for us to start adding human behavior into those models. It's also important for us to start thinking about what are the, what the economic costs are and what the indirect effects of crisis and then a lockdown, which, you know, and social distancing, of course, imposes economic distancing, what those like downstream effects might be. And to get a handle on the right evidence-based policy, you need to think about both the economics as well as the public health, of course. And, and so we were trying to sort of add to like some of the standard models that were influential for US UK policy. Like, like, you know, we heard a lot about the Imperial College model, for example, and just started inserting economics into it, especially in data from developing countries. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about this today. Um, and then let me just, I'll point out, I, I should move on to from this slide, let me just point out two additional things. So one is there are, you know, based on all this data, it became clear that there are some specific interventions that may be required. So I'll tell you a lot about our work on producing and distributing masks. We are now running, uh, at the request of the WHO chief scientists, we're running um, a large scale trial involving 700,000 people in rural Bangladesh distributing masks and then doing seroprevalence surveys to see whether masks are actually effective at reducing COVID transmission if you are able to induce um, community level mask wearing norms. Um, and also we're also answering the question are masks protective for the wearer as well and doing individual level experiments. So that's one stream that I'll tell you a little bit about. Another stream that I won't tell you too much about but it's much more economics uh, but I'll just highlight uh, what the challenge is that regardless of your position on social distancing and lockdowns, right, it became clear that especially in low and middle income countries that we need to get relief, like social protection payments in the hands of people very, very quickly, right? And that leads to a new challenge, which is in the US, you can just, you know, uh, say, look at last year's tax returns and figure out who wasn't earning very much and send them some money. But in Bangladesh, where like less than maybe two to 3% of people submit tax returns and the people who need social protections really don't, right? How do you identify the poor? How do you identify the people who are suffering right now during this crisis and, and need support, right? So for my 20, 30,000 people, I have very good data because I had baseline information plus phone survey data on how, what their life is like today. But we need to solve the problem for 150 million. So how do you quickly scale up from 20, 30,000 to 150 million? And, and so the, the trick we're using here is, is that you know, for those 20, 30,000 people, I have sort of the ground truth from my data, survey data on who's suffering and who's not, who, who deserves support more. We also have the cell phone numbers. And if you can connect that to cell phone, like what's called call detail record, CDR data, um, to understand the patterns of cell phone usage, then it turns out it won't surprise you to learn that uh, the poor and the non-poor use their phones somewhat differently. So you could, you know, at least a machine learning algorithm given that I know who's poor and who's non-poor in my sample of 20 to 30,000, right? And use machine learning to try and pick up the subtle patterns of cell phone usage that are predictive of somebody being poor. And if there's an algorithm you can devise that you feel confident in, then you can return that back to the cell phone company who can then run it on their entire subscriber base, right? And that will give us some signals, some hints as to who's poor, who's likely to be suffering. And then you can send them text messages and follow that up with, um, with like some human uh, checks. And balances. Okay, so I won't talk to you too much about that project, um, uh, but I will tell you about mass and I'll tell you a little bit about what we learned from uh, the epidemiological modeling. Okay. So uh, in terms of epidemiological modeling, here's the situation we had in low and middle income countries. I'm just going to give you one quick insight, right? So unlike say Ebola, Zika, etc., what was unusual about the COVID crisis is that it hit the rich countries first, right? The US, UK, and we started hearing a lot about what 
these countries were doing. Because when something hits the US, it just kind of sucks up all the oxygen in the international media, and you just keep hearing about that, right? And the uh, risk there is that, let's say there's a strategy that is sensible for the US, given what that, say, the imperial colony model was telling us, right? Now, if it's sensible for the US, it doesn't necessarily mean it's also sensible for the rest of the world, okay? And, and then the political problem we have is that, you know, regardless of what a leader in a developing country would do, it's going to make them look bad. Like either lots of people will die from the virus or if, uh, you know, uh, or if they impose lockdowns, then people are going to be suffering in other ways, right? So for, for a politi political leader, then it's very difficult when, you know, you're between a rock and a hard place, it's very difficult for you to do anything that's different than what, say, the US and UK are doing, right? Because at least if, if, if you're doing poorly, but you follow what everybody else is doing, you have some cover. Whereas if you go your own way and then people suffer, they will for sure in some way, then you, know, you, you might be blamed for it, right? So that's why I kind of inserted the developing country data into these models to see if we get a different answer or not. It turns out you do get different answers and let me give you the intuition for why. So one is that the age distribution of the population in low-income countries is very different than in high-income countries, right? In low-income, very small fraction of the population is elderly. In high-income, much larger fraction of the population is elderly. Uh, this is a distribution of countries with the percent of the population over the age of 65, right? So there's a six-fold difference here. And given that COVID was much more deadly for, for older people, right? You're going to get differences in between rich and poor countries in terms of the benefits of social distancing, right? And a second reason you get differences when we look, you know, when we like insert developing country data in, the, in those imperial college type models, the EPI models, is that, you know, remember we were trying to flatten the curve in order to keep it under the, the healthcare capacity line so that we don't have any excess unnecessary deaths. Now in rural Bangladesh or Sierra Leone, if the healthcare capacity line is like down here, right? Then by delaying infections and flattening the curve, you're not going to be able to save any additional lives. You, you might delay some infections, right? But, but you know, you're not going to see the benefits that you see in a rich country with adequate healthcare capacity. Right? So those are the reasons why the benefits are low. And then, so therefore you have to compare it to the cost of social distancing, which we did by, you know, collecting data. As I said, we were collecting high frequency data from you know, directly by conducting thousands of surveys. You need to do that because most people are in the informal sector, so you need to talk to them directly. You can't rely on administrative records like you can in the United States. So what you find is, let me show you a little, little bit of what you find. Um, so this is so baseline data, like pre-COVID data, like month after month, we were tracking these people. This data is from rural Nepal, right? There's some seasonal variation in how much they work, how many hours of, uh, of work they have available. And here's what happens post lockdown. There's a sharp drop in employment, okay? And this also leads to increases in food insecurity. So there's huge seasonality in food insecurity for those who know agrarian areas in developing countries. This is because pre-harvest period is a lean period where there's a lot of insecurity, which is actually why this project was done. Uh, my, my work is on addressing seasonal food insecurity and, and low caloric intake during this period. Now, after the harvest, food insecurity goes down, right? And what ends up happening is that post-COVID, even though it's a harvest period, food insecurity starts approaching what you see in the normal lean season, right? So you look at, you know, people worried about food. In this harvest period, as many people are worried about food as they were in the lean period the previous year, okay? And then when you ask people, it turns out it's the food insecurity and income shocks that are their primary concerns, not health and safety, not the COVID stuff, right? So first I was saying the benefits of distancing was different and then the costs were also very different because you know, in a developed country like in the US, you and I can sit at our computers, get our work done as we are doing right now. But, in, but think about a day wage laborer in Bangladesh, right? If he doesn't get to work that week, he might, his family might not get enough to eat, right? And that has very different implications of uh, social distancing than, than we do in the US. So we need to think about things differently. It's not that I'm saying that no, lockdowns are a bad idea or social distancing is a bad idea. Uh, but what I was trying to, uh, trying to point out is that each country needs to think about the full range of costs and benefits, not just deaths from virus, but deaths from other causes as well, food insecurity, which has implications for people's welfare, and make decisions as the best fit for that country, uh, not, not just blindly follow what the US is doing. All right, so now, given that I have only five minutes left, I'll just give you a quick 
uh, overview of what we're doing with face masks. So we're doing a very large scale trial, as I said, and this is a combined trial with economists uh, from Yale, but also um, uh, uh, people from medical school, from Stan Stanford um, uh, Medical School, uh, Steve Luby and his group, as well as uh, uh, epidemiologists who are based in, uh, in Bangladesh, including um, the Associate Director General of Health in Bangladesh, as well as some local universities. Yeah. So um, what we're trying to do here is, is basically a two-stage project. So what we, uh, so actually just to give you the intellectual history of this, so back in April, I had an agreement from some donors here from Silicon Valley, and they were willing to invest a lot to do a large scale math trial. And then when I was collecting this high frequency data, what I found was like late March, nobody was wearing masks. By late April in both Bangladesh and Nepal, like 80, 90% of people were reporting that they had masks. Okay? But we kept digging into it to see if it was social desirability bias or people answering these questions for us, et cetera. We were asking people about how do, you, you know, do other people around you wear masks. And then we started like stationing people, hundreds of people in thousands of locations, mosques and markets around the country, and noticed that even though people had masks, over time what was happening was that about two thirds of the time they weren't putting it on. And then if you actually use a indicator for are they wearing the mask properly, um, then you get like people, teens, like no more than 10, 15% of people wearing masks properly. So then we kind of resuscitated that project, even though we had um, shut it down after seeing 80, 90%. Okay. And, and so, but it became clear from that experience, from our data, that solving the mask problem is not just about a distribution problem that you just need to give people masks. Right? You also have to ensure that they wear it consistently. So you do need to do monitoring, enforcement, et cetera. Right? And so we are doing, um, our study is quite intense, multi-pronged, multi-arm because of this reason, which is that we need to distribute masks. We need to you know, design those masks well. So there are engineers on the team who are doing that. We need to, um, because we, we learned in Bangladesh uh, through this process that they are the same ready-made garment factories can produce like masks with 95% filtration efficiency, but also with like 15% efficiency. Uh, and so you need to be careful about mass design. And then we need to set up this whole infrastructure of monitoring enforcement, working with community leaders, the mosque imams, and the people like the bazaar committees in, in markets, right, to ensure that the vendors are always wearing masks and having mask promoters in the villages, reminding people, right? And then we're experimenting with things like providing incentives to the community to wear masks, like providing incentives to the leaders, both monetary incentive and then also randomizing in sort of certificates given by the government or partner in the, the kind of the central government uh, in order to see what, how to get people to wear masks. So that's the first stage. And then the second stage, we take blood spots both before and after the trial in order to, um, um, uh, Okay, yeah, so I'll just put this up, the study design so you can see it. So we take blood spots in order to do seroprevalence to see whether or not antibodies um, appear in sort of the treatment villages relative to the control. And then we also do an individual level experiment with some vendors to, to test whether or not masks are actually protective. So this is, these are vendors who are at high um, kind of um, high traffic areas. Oh, I have 25 minutes. And I started at 9.05, so I guess I have five minutes. I thought I was ending at 9.25. Um, so with my five minutes... You're um, fine. You're fine. <laughs> um, so with my five minutes, what I'll do is... Let's see. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly run through uh, what, what, the, what the design is. So what we do is we take um, Upazilas are sub-districts, and we take one village in the sub-district, and, and then you match up two different villages in terms of whether or not, you know, in terms of the population size, as well as the COVID case trajectory, which we get from the government, right? And uh, what we end up doing is we take villages that are, um, that are, are matched up in, in these two dimensions and randomly assign one to treatment and control. And, and then we create the catchment area around the village. So not only all village residents, but also the markets where they shop, right? That's part of the catchment area because that's a high traffic area. The mosque that's serving the village, which is another high traffic area where people get together, especially on Fridays in dense environments. And so it's an important sort of place to do this intervention. And, and we randomly assign to treatment and control. Okay. So, um, so the primary outcome we're interested in, I mean, this is primarily a health study, it's a second stage outcome, which is what's happening to uh, 
symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. So which is first we collect data, sort of phone survey uh, or in-person survey data on whether or not the people are exhibiting respiratory symptoms, right? And then we um, uh, you know, prioritize for testing people who have, who have symptoms and we do serological testing. Uh, but then we're also doing a lot of direct observation to understand the impact of the intervention on mask use and mass markets of the public areas, right? And then we're experimenting with things like those certificates and incentives and so forth. Okay. Um, and it turns out like from our pilot, what we've learned so far is even without all the bells and whistles we've added, just a basic set of interventions that include some monitoring, that increase in our pilots increased mask usage by about 40 percentage points, which was about basically tripling mask usage. But we were trying to get that even higher. Um, and because you know, answering this question requires a very large scale study, because you know, if COVID rates are low in rural Bangladesh, then you need large samples in order to statistically detect the effects on, uh, on infection. Uh, so we are massively, you know, we're powered for this, which means that we're massively overpowered for all the mask use outcomes, uh, which is much easier to detect, of course, uh, because it's not such a rare outcome. Okay. So given that we're overpowered, let me um, let me just jump to uh, jump to like what are the randomizations we're doing? Okay, so given the real power, we are experimenting with both. Like a third of the villages get cloth masks, and a third get surgical masks. Okay, and the reason is um, you know cloth masks are washable, right? People prefer them, but surgical masks are about one fifth as expensive. And, you know, and we put a logo here with the Bangladesh, you know, flag and say that this, this is a mask you can wash and reuse because we've done tests in, in engineering labs, both in India and in Stanford, and at Stanford, you can wash the surgical mask up to six times and it still retains um, pretty good efficiency, filtration efficiency. So that's one. And then we, you know, other things that we're trying out is getting people to make verbal commitments about you know, that they will be a mask wearing household, but also publicizing, telling them that we're gonna publicize your commitment because this is a case where social norms matter a lot. So what we're trying to do is run some interventions in order to try and promote social norms to the extent possible. You know what, let me stop here. Um, I mean, of course, it's a complicated study, there's a lot to say, but I will instead, you know, just use the time for questions and see what, um, uh, it'll be better to just have a back and forth. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so my first thought was much of what you said would seem applicable to the first world as well as the third world. That is issues of compliance, um, you know, issues of pushback, um, uh, issues of, of the cost of, of a lockdown um, all seem relevant to New York as much as so Bangladesh. The important uh, scientific point you're making with that comment, which is about external validity, right? So we're running a randomized control trial, which is internally valid, right? And it has two stages to it, right? So first stage is how do you get people to wear masks? And the second stage is, are masks protective and do, do mass reduce transmission? Right? So the second stage question, you know, that's about the interaction of the virus and a filtration device, right? That probably has very good external validity. We wouldn't need to do that trial everywhere. However, that first stage, how do you get people to wear masks, right? You, we do it in Bangladesh through a certain set of strategies that involve mosque imams, et cetera. But obviously that's not the right strategy to try out in the United States. So even though the issues are relevant, the solution may be different. And so the way we're proceeding is the first stage trial is a much cheaper trial. The second stage is what's expensive because of the ser serological testing. So the first stage trial, we're simultaneously also now running in Mali, right? And if it proves to be successful, I think it's worth trying these things out also in um, Western nations. And, and, and in that, it's striking to me how uh, you make the point that it's uh, the benefits, the cost benefits situation is totally different in that, you know, the, uh, the benefit may be much less if your health system can't handle even the improvement that you get and the costs of wearing masks may be much, you know, or of not wearing, a, it may be worse, may be different because uh, the unemployment situation is so much more serious to a third world than a first Absolutely. world. And also the, the, the nature of work is different when you're in a humid environment and inside a factory that's hot, right? 
the cost of running a mass be very different from when you and I are teaching, for example. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's true. And you, you know, we tend not to think of these differences. Yeah. So it's really important. And in fact, like what we've learned is even in our mass design, right, that work has to be taken seriously because the appropriate design of mass, sort of balancing filtration concerns with comfort concerns, will also have to be different across uh, different parts of the world, just based on weather. Yeah, I mean, here, there's a lot of debate about, uh, you know, N95s versus surgical masks in terms of uh, protection of you versus protection of others. Um, yeah. Well, I see a couple of questions on yes. uh, cell phone data. Uh, yes. So someone is asking um, about the privacy issue, really, I guess. And that is, is the information that's collected uh, something that the cell users are made aware of? Um, or can they opt in and out of that? Uh, yeah. and, and, and then, okay, great. I'll answer that question along with Lex's question. Lex is a co-author. Um, yeah. On, um, on, uh, on inaccuracy in this mechanism. So first of all, yes, the privacy concerns are paramount. And so we are doing this in partnership with the, you know, the major tele telecom companies in Bangladesh, like their Verizon and, and AT&T equivalent, um, which has parent companies that have a bunch of privacy concerns. But more importantly, the government has, um, has, has very careful um, blocks in place because the only, uh, allowable use of cell phone data uh, legally uh, so far has been on um, uh, for for say anti-terrorism purposes of tracking and so forth. Right? So we are actually not taking the data out. We're doing it inside the servers of uh, of the of the government. Right? And we have, I mean, without getting into too much detail, like there is different teams at Berkeley, at Yale, and in the government who are doing different parts of the uh, of, of the exercise of developing the algorithm, like the statistical modeling part versus the machine learning part, et cetera. And then, uh, and then in you know inside the same servers that the cell phone companies that the, the majority of the data now reside, that's where we'll um, that's where most of the work actually happens. So yeah, it, it's, it's an important concern and we are trying to be careful about it. Um, I mean, I could probably talk for half an hour about that. <laughs> and Lex's question about inaccuracy. Yes, so, uh, so we have, it's a really good question. So one problem is that some people don't have cell phones, right? Which is true for about 10, 15% of the population, okay? Now that itself, I mean, the fact that 85% of the population do itself tells you why this is the strategy to use because the government doesn't have data on 150 million people. Researchers like me don't have data. The only thing that people, everybody seems to carry on in the pocket is a cell phone and that leaves some traps as to, uh, you know, who's poor and what their behavior is, which is why you want to start with this, right? It's the, it's the imperfect but best thing to use. And, and then what we're going to do is, you know, as I said, we have data on about 30,000 people where I have the ground truth of who's poor and stuff, right? So what I can do is run the machine learning algorithm on just, let's say, 20,000 of the 30,000, okay? And then I leave 10,000 as a holdout sample, okay? So what I can, I, what I can do is with the 20,000, I can train the machine learning algorithm, develop the model, and then I can test how well it does to predict the poor in the 10,000. <laughs> So beyond the test, it also allows us to identify what systematic errors might be, what might we be making. So for example, I mean, just to add to Lex's concern, it could be that we miss the poorest of the poor who don't have cell phones, or we miss women, right? And so what you can then do is go back and try and adjust the algorithm, right? Not, you know, have a broader objective function, which is not just about maximizing the prediction value, but also ad addressing these types of systematic errors, right? in order to, to you know, do a bunch of testing, iterate and go back and forth, right? And then what you can do is you, sh you shouldn't leave it up to a machine to decide who gets transferred. And right? that's not gonna be socially acceptable anyway. So then you would, uh, you know, maybe, you know, get the machine to tell you who the high likelihood of needing support, a median likelihood, right? And then you could send different text messages to people who come up as high likelihood and medium likelihood, get them to do some self-targeting, right? Do some sort of human checks that way, right? And finally, uh, this is the way if, you know, conditional on the privacy issues that we, we already discussed, if, if uh, we're, we're proceeding, what we've agreed with the government is not to take this approach and then scale it up nationwide all at once. What we would wanna do, like normally what we do at Y-Rise is that we would pilot this. So in some unions or sub-districts in the country, you wanna use the machine-based approach. In other unions, you would wanna use 
um, the traditional approach, which is like politicians making a list and you have to give money to the people who come up with their list, right? Which has a different set of problems, right? And then you can test, like since we're collecting the phones every day anyway, you can, if you do the, do this test in those areas, you can test whether or not um, one strategy works better or worse than the other. So thank you very much. This is good. I think we have to move on. Yeah, it's really fascinating to think of the issues of the data collection and, and implementation of what you do with that data. And um, yeah, uh, thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, and thank you for the questions. Excellent questions.